Okay, good evening. I think we're going to just start off immediately so that those sleeping bags that you came with will not work. <laughs> All right. Um, we are asked to speak on a topic that many of us here are already vast in, and uh, we are simply from my own estimation, just going to reaffirm and remind ourselves of the things that we already know about. And the topic that I was asked to discuss tonight is abortion, now in America. And I have, uh, from consultation, both from the church perspective and from other scholars, come up with this uh, definition of abortion as a deliberate and a direct killing of a human person in the womb any time from conception to birth. And you will find that uh, many people are not going to buy into this definition as simple as it seems. But a lot of controversies we bother on aspects of the wordings of this definition which we'll see why and how they did that. Every year throughout the world, there is an estimation of 180 million pregnancies that occur around the world every year. A quarter of that number, which is about 45 million, end in abortion, 125 thousand abortions occur every day and for every a thousand pregnancies that occur among women between the ages of 15 and 44 about 35 of them end in abortion fortunately um, I mean unfortunately here in America 3,000 approximately 3,000 abortions every day and approximately 2 million every year. Abortion is not something new. It didn't start with our generation. It didn't start with any generation that we can blame specifically for. It has been there. But what was not there was the public discussion and public acclamation of abortion. And if we trace this history down to where we would think is the time that it began to be so well popularized, it didn't start as you know, an issue of abortion, let us begin abortion and stuff like that. It began just from coming from the back door, things happening that we are trying to destroy human life directly or indirectly. And you see people like Thomas Malthus, who was propounding this uh, population control issue and was uh, coming up with uh, this suggestion that I'm sure that some of you already know his theory of uh, population. In England in the 18th century, after the agricultural revolution, people were living longer and the population was increasing by one and a half percent every year. And that kind of like prepared the ground for him to begin to think that if population continues to increase unchecked, then in the next 25 years from the time that he was making his prediction, then there will be a doubling of the population. And that doubling of the population of England would be a threat to everybody. And so he was suggesting that there should be a way of balancing what he called population and product production, meaning food production. And he came to the conclusion that it's really difficult to balance, to have that balance between productivity and population. 
And for that reason, if we cannot balance productivity and population, I mean productivity of food and population, then we have to come up with some kind of solution so that in the future, everybody is not going to starve and everybody is not going to be under the same danger of not having enough. So he began to propose that certain measures should be adopted in order to kill off, he was specific, the poor. And you could see some of his proposals on wholesome occupation, severe labor, exposure to the seasons, extreme poverty. Don't take care of children the way that we do today because some of them, war, epidemics, and the famine, all those kind of things. When we bring those things in, then we would use them to target the poor and begin to eliminate them gradually. And if, with that, you know, when we do that, then the rich, we get, you know, the better off of the situation. And after he did that, then he was followed by Charles Darwin. And, it, you know, it's, it's really surprising that sometimes some of the people that history have, uh, has acclaimed so high as the genesis of our times. When you look at some of their theories, it just looks so, you know, you just wonder, <coughs> have we always been thinking? Okay, so Charles Darwin was talking about every one of us having the same origin, coming from the same species of uh, ancestors. Then over the years, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're familiar, so I'm not going to go into all that. Anyway, but specifically, he was saying that nature has its own way of eliminating those species that don't have the natural ability to adapt to the environment. Nature has its own way of eliminating them. And he was looking at, he was using biological principles to, propose, to make his proposal. But just because he said that, some people got interested in that. And one of the people that actually got more interested in what he said was Herbert Spencer. He, while Darwin was trying to make his proposal from the biological point of view, this man took it a step further and brought it to the social and the political spheres. And he was saying that, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is not, all right. Anyway, he was trying to say that if we want to evaluate the quality of people, then you have to do that looking at their social values. And again, he brought it down to if you are rich or if you are poor. And he was saying that if you are rich, then you are the feet of the society. If you are poor, you are part of the class of the unfit of the society. And what these people are trying to say is that, you know, all the social programs that are used to help the poor, and mind you, if you see how this poverty of a thing that has now become a problem to the rich started, it, the England, after their, what they call the Enclosure Act, where they took the lands from the poor people and the, you know, the, the, the little ways that they were sustaining themselves were taken away from them and the, all the farmlands were bought up by the rich in order that agriculture may blossom kind of thing. So we intentionally created the atmosphere to create, to make some people poor. And then after we made them poor, then we began to say, they, they don't look like us. They are unfit. And so we have to get, you know, find ways of, you know, taking them out of the society. So uh, Spencer was one of those people that brought the biological theory of Darwin into the political and social sphere. And after that comes the theory of eugenics, which is the theory of, that was asking how do we improve the stock of human beings. And he was talking about heredity, 
hereditary. You know, if you uh, if you, there, there are some qualities in us that make us super humans, and there are some qualities that really, if you have it, you don't have the chance to live and to survive. And he was thinking about the future and how to create the genesis of the future. He was thinking about how to match, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Threats, qualities from the super people and they blend them together so that we begin now to uh, match the kind of human beings that we want to see in the future. And by doing that, if we do that, then those people that are sub, subhuman, sub super, will eventually be eliminated. So uh, you see, some of the strategies that were being used to target the unfit of the society. But at, that, at this level, people were looking basically, mostly at the rich, comparing the rich and the poor, and comparing the educated and the uneducated, because these people that were making these proposals and propounding these theories, they all came from well-off families, and they didn't see much need for the poor and the uneducated to compete with them with the natural resources. Then, those people were English people, all from England. Eventually, these theories came down to us here in America in a very strong way through the lady, Margaret Sanger, and I'm sure. I'm making a lot of assumptions here that some of these individuals, you already know about them, but I'm preparing the ground for what actually brought about the topic that we want to discuss tonight. So Margaret Sanger, with his birth control clinic all over the place, you know, he, very influential for over three decades. Influential both among the rich, among the political class, and both nationally and internationally, he was so influential. And she was just carrying the campaign everywhere that starting from the kind of emotional stuff about women, that women are mistreated and, uh, because, uh, they, they, because of pregnancy and everything like that, they, they are being deprived of some of their rights. And then she began to uh, you know, establish this uh, Planned Parenthood where she had to uh, educate women on their rights and then educate them on how to use contraceptives and everything like that, you know, just other things. So he, she was actually the one that prepared the stage for massive killing through abortion, making it seem like it is legal. But at the same time, during her time, it was not yet legalized. After all these preliminaries of trying to make some lives inferior to others. Then we came to the real platform where we say, we have talked about these, these issues so much, and now I think it is time to make a declaration, a formal declaration about abortion. And that's when the Supreme Court came into play in 1973. And that was the time the Supreme Court says, now, abortion is legal. Every woman has the right to obtain abortion. And the, the basis was that every person has the right to privacy in the 14th Amendment clause, right to privacy. And therefore, we can do abortion from the time the Supreme Court legalized abortion, what people have done between the pro-choicers and the pro-lifers is battle between trying to keep the abortion law as it is and trying to 
overturn the abortion law. So the, the, the battle has been raging between the two camps, the pro-choicers and the pro-lifers. And this battle has taken basically four major dimensions, as we can see. In the scientific dimension, the argument was the Supreme Court says if theologians, if philosophers, and if scientists are not able to decide when human life starts, they are not going to burden themselves with anything about that. It's not their own responsibility to say when human life started. And that is basically, uh, you see that it is the foundation of all the arguments, when does human life start? Because scientifically, according to their own assumption that they don't know, then they have to make their own declaration. Just like in ignorance, just like in doubt. And I used to know that you know, the simple Latin adage says, in dubio, non agere, in doubt, do not act. If you are in doubt, do not rush to a conclusion. And that's like what the Supreme Court has assumed, that they are in doubt, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We will still make our conclusion. Abortion is legal, you know. So from that moment, the, the, the Supreme Court gave every woman the right to obtain abortion any time during pregnancy, any time during pregnancy. But like what they said, that science has not proved when human life starts. Science actually says that human life starts from conception, and conception starts from the zygote, the zygote. The very moment that there is union between the oozite and the sperm, that's when life starts. And that's actually the moment of conception. So science is not in doubt about when life starts. They are clear about it, that it is at the time of conception. That's the time you and I began to be human, began to be individual persons. And it, it, remember, we are talking about the scientific proof about human origin. And I have to say that emphatically because when you look at the next slide here that says that fut future heart begins from 18 day after conception. 18th day, and heartbeat, excuse me, heartbeat, 21 to 24 days after conception. Brain begins to form, 23 days. Brain wave, six weeks. You know that when you come to the hospital sometimes and the doctors, uh, in respect to every physician, the doctors say she, she doesn't or he doesn't have any vital sign anymore. The brain is dead and the heart has stopped beating, right? Then they can pronounce you and I dead. <laughs> uh, so, but we are looking at the physiological aspects of us. The doctor is looking at the physiology. What physiological aspects of, of us could stop to show us vital signs, then we will be able to say they are no longer alive. That's what we are looking at here. So that it is only from the 18th day that uh, physiologically uh, science could begin to observe a sign of life in us. I, I say again, physiologically. Okay? Because eventually it's not going to be the same morally. <laughs> spiritually, you know. Okay. What that means is that 
78% of abortions occur after brainwave has begun. Because if you, if you remember that we say brainwave starts from six weeks, at six weeks, then you count from the seventh. This is not so clear. Anyway, the seventh year, 18, 1842. So after six weeks, abortion that occurs on the seventh week is 18%. On the eighth week is 18%, and after, eight weeks and after, is 42%. So, all the ab abortions start to happen after brainwave, the, the, the things that science has given us as the time, life, vital sign, begins. So, abortions occur after. It's no longer a question that, is it human? Is it, has it, does it have life? So, what we abort... After these days, science knows that it is human life. This uh, a, 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 a grief and, uh, if you like, mea culpa, a, a, a sad story of a mother, or to be a mother, who aborted on the seventh week. And she went and took a pill after pregnancy. She took a pill, you know, consciously, just like many people did or do. She took a pill after seven weeks of pregnancy. And then she went to the bathroom. And using the commode, she said she passed the placenta. And what she saw was a human being with hand and fingers after you know, on the seventh week, she, the, 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 the infant was already seen visible with hands and with fingers. Sometimes people will not know it that much, but with magnifying lens sometimes you will see better the pictures that it is really human being that is forming already at that tender stage. Conclusions that we draw from Science are these. Human life begins at conception. We've said that human development proceeds very rapidly, very rapidly. So that if you are thinking that maybe it is in this month or in this year that human beings begin to form, it proceeds rapidly. Abortion stops a bit in heart, and heart begins to beat in the 21 to 24 days. Most abortions occur after the fetus exhib exhibits brain wave. And we say brain wave at the sixth week. Legal battle. And this is, this is the more interesting aspect of the, of the battle. When we talk about Roe versus Wade, we are talking about the voice of the court that is pro-choice. That's what it represents, as far as I'm concerned. The voice of the court that is pro-choice. And Roe versus Wade, like we have said, established viability at birth. So that abortion is allowed any time from conception to birth. And let us see this. Uh, science has three major, uh, call it trimesters, that they look at human beings, uh, human development. The first trimester is between, is in the first three months of pregnancy. And the second trimester is in the second 12 weeks of pregnancy. And the third trimester is in the third uh, six weeks, uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy. That means 1 to 12 is the first trimester. Uh, 13 to 24 is the second trimester. And the 25 to 36 is the third trimester. Now, uh, Roe versus Wade is saying that abortion could occur at any time during the tri three trimesters. Of pregnancy. And this is what we see in the first trimester. 
a human being of this shape. And this is only on the eight and a half week, not nine, not 10, not 11, not 12. 12 will be the end of the first trimester. But already on the eight, eight and a half week, we see human development as big as this. And this is the 16th week, as big as this. And this is the 32, 32nd week, as big as this. And what Roe versus Wales has ruled is that in all the stages of the trimesters, abortion could occur. From the beginning of conception to birth. Again, Doe versus Burton, we say a companion to Roe versus Wade, allows abortion where continued pregnancy will be endangering the health of the mother. Another decision by the Supreme Court says the stand, this, this one is very interesting. You know, saying that this child is a minor, and so if she wants to obtain abortion, that she needs the consent of the parents. And it started from the argument whether it's going to be the two parents or whether it's going to be one parent, you know, back and forth argument and all those things. But then, after all that, when it is settled that the minor is good, should obtain uh, permission, consent from the parents in order to get abortion, this court decided that if this minor, or well, that the parents should also give the minor some kind of flexibility so that if the minor is showing some level of maturity, to make the decision. So that one is funny. To, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, she's a minor, right? But at this, you know, with this situation, she is a minor to some extent and no longer a minor if she is able to make her own judgment, mature enough to make her own judgment. She is no longer a minor. The same minor that cannot, you know, for example, drive, for example, make some decisions because she is minor. Now in abortion, there's a flexibility. You understand? They can be given some flexibility to make some decisions by themselves. And the thing that is so funny says, when it is in their own best interest, in their own best interest, that kind of selfishness that drives many people in their own best interest, interest, they could care, right? Anyway. And this other court struck down Nebraska ban on partial birth abortion. I want you to know where we are going, that these laws is, are telling us that there's, you know, the, the, the court is giving allowance for people to do abortion. And there are some states that in some cases are trying to, you know, regulate abortion at least in some way. But the Supreme Court is trying to, in one way or another, say that, no, you know, this, the decision of this Supreme Court should prevail over what you have said. And so, since we have allowed abortion on the, tri on the last trimester, of pregnancy, then partial birth abortion can also occur. Mostly, partial birth abortion occurs on the last trimester of pregnancy. And you see what they do? Deliver the baby halfway, and then use the tube to puncture the brain and kill the baby. Sometimes you begin to wonder, do people actually do this? And how do they feel? Is it real? But the, the time you know that it is real is when you see the number of people that support abortion. And what is the sense for this partial birth abortion? 
Well, it, it, it would have been better for you to deliver the baby full and look at him and just scale so that you have the full effect of what you're doing. It's, not, it's no longer a question whether she is human or not. It's just a question of brutality. And pro-choice as We're still arguing that if abortion does not take place, then it's going to lead to child abuse. And during the Clinton administration, rape and incest were covered for Medicaid funding for abortion. And of course, you know, the letters that happened, Obama extending the lines of research for human embryonic stem cell, all those kind of things. So those controversies, some of them are still with us. All of them are still with us. Some of them, the pro-lifers, have made some dents in order to counter them, but not as much as to change a whole lot of things. Pro-lifers simply say abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. When we want to say, you know, do abortion, we begin to establish the non-humanity of some individuals, just like the previous predecessors we are saying, the poor and the uneducated are unfit and less human, and therefore let's eliminate them. So the unfit in our own society today will be the unborn child, right? So let us eliminate them. But the pro-life has said abortion simply murder from the moment of conception to birth. The, you know, what you see in the two other slide, slides is that the, 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 the argument that if you all want to do abortion, that is fine, but then let us not use our public fund to do that. And to some extent, we have succeeded at least in eliminating some of them. If you are working for the plant, uh, family planning clinics and the, all those things, you are not allowed to use the Title, title 10 fund. You know, the Title 10 fund, I know you know about it, is every year about uh, 300 million goes to family planning clinics just to support the family planning businesses. And the, in the family planning, just like in the Margaret Singer uh, clinics, they teach people on how to use uh, contraceptives, teach people about abortion, abortion stuff, encourage it sometimes. But surprisingly, you know, the, the, the kind of money that goes in there surprises you, like 300 million every year. If you are doing some kind of demonstration, it used to be that the argument was that you give 300 feet buffer, 300 gap, 300 feet gap from the clinic where you want to do your demonstration. But the court says that burdens more speech. I don't want to strain myself too hard in order to be hard, in order to make my point. And I don't want to disturb the neighbor, the innocent neighbors where this clinic is. So instead of 300 feet buffer, it's now allowed 36 feet so that we can do demonstration before the clinic 36 feet from there. And some people say, what about the observed images that we use? You know, those images that show uh, aborted children. Sometimes when you look at them, they are so, you know, emotional. They are so touchy. How could people just shed blood this way? So people, people don't want to see that and see the truth. So people had fought against that. But the court, in our own favor, says we have to uphold it. 
One president that has been on our side, George Bush, he was the one that was trying to limit the research boundaries for the use of human embryos for researches and for experiments. And um, there was a study that was done in Canada, and it says, contrary to what people were saying, that abortion, uh, if a child is not aborted, then it's going to lead to child abuse when the mother sees it. But the st a research that was done is showing that actually it is abortion that leads to child abuse because it leads to guilt in the first place. Moral battles on these levels. The pro-choice has said that if we allow abortion, then we are going to prevent the deaths that occur from doing abortion secretly, privately, in the private clinics, probably in the quack clinics also. Rape, incest, future abnormalities or other traits to mother's life or health, is what they allege. Uh, if we don't legalize abortion, then how do we handle those situations? And the abortion, if we want to carry our baby and insist that a mother that has no job has to have his baby, how is she going to raise them and all that? So all those emotional arguments are what come into play, listening to the pro-choices. What this man was saying, you know, some of the lies that people say, do sometimes, when they are in government or when they're in the public service, they want to say things that the public want to hear about, but very far from the truth. People could say that women die in thousands if abortion is not legalized. But this man was, whatever he was, was saying that the number that they gave as to the number of women that died from abortion when it was not legalized was like 5,000 or 10,000 every year. And after he had resigned from his office, he confessed that that number was a complete lie. And if it was lie, and you were feeding the people with all that, do you consider how many people that you have killed before you began to tell the truth? What people don't normally think about. Abortion must be available for cases of rape or incest. And the pro-lifers are saying, it's only 1% of incest that occurs for abortion. It's only 1% also for abnormality, only 3% for risk of the murder. So this percentage, is it enough to say that abortion is going to be unbeneficial, beneficial to the mother? Pregnancy subjugates women, interferes with career and educational choices. And we know that it is not true because most women during pregnancy, they don't, it doesn't interfere with their school, especially at pregnancy. Yeah, you could have, I was very happy when, I, when my, my sister told me a while ago, my last sister, and she said that she, after she had her baby, that she has three months leave and then another one month was added while she was trying to complete the third month, you know, so that the government can now allow uh, paid time off for nursing mothers for four months in Nigeria. Just a recognition of the importance of what they have done, of the role of being a mother. And uh, there's no, nobody can actually look down on that precious responsibility that God has given to women, you know. So, every argument about how 
pregnancy is trying to slow down the life of mothers has been trashed because you cannot be sacked from your job because you are pregnant and you cannot be denied of working because you are pregnant. You have all the rights when you are pregnant. And of course, the joy of having a baby when you have got your, your, your baby with you. Fetus, the pro-lifers. Fetus is not a part of a woman's body. Well, I'm sorry, well, women, we are, uh, the pro-choice, as we are saying, that women have the right to control their bodies. The pro-choice, uh, li the pro-life, as we are saying, that fetus is not part of your body. It's not your own body. You have different DNA. You have separate circulatory system. It's two individuals. And the, only, the, the least you can do is to respect that individual in you with you as much as you can respect yourself. Respect their lives as much as you can respect your own life. Countries that did not legalize abortion have overpopulation problem. Nigeria did not legalize abortion. We have about 140 million. That's the census we work with in Nigeria. And I can tell you that we have not all died of starvation and hunger and poverty. So if we say that overpopulation is a problem and then we have to legalize abortion in order to check it, well, there are other things that we could consider about checking the population. We can condone war. We can condone hunger, stop production. Let's starve a certain group of people. And then the population can be controlled. So if you can't allow, uh, allow the control of a population from starvation, from hunger, and from all that, why do you want to allow it through abortion? And if you remember from our definition that fetus, that abortion is the direct and the deliberate killing of a human person. Now the word person comes prominent in the discussion of abortion because some people simply see the social aspect of the individual as the only quality the individual has that makes them a human being. And so, if you can't interact because you are in the womb, if you don't have that ability to interact with other members of the society just because you're in the womb, then you are not a human person. That's what it means. And you look at it, even philosophy has defined man as homo sapiens, a wise person, which has its own problem. But all this is trying to show us that every attempt that we make to define the human person from the philosophical only and the physiological only point of view will not describe fully who we are. So we are not just social beings. It's only sociologists that can define human beings only from the social point of view and say if we cannot interact with other human beings, then we are not human. The baby in the womb has no chance because she or he is not a, a social being. Human person is defined by the pro-lifers as one. At the same time, corporeal, and the spiritual body and soul. And you see, that's where science did not get it complete when I was talking about the scientific definition. The science can only give us a physiological definition, approach to life of the human person. But that does not mean that 
unless one is 18 days when the heart, uh, when the brain begins to move, or maybe six weeks when the brain begins to move, that they are not human. Human beings are ensouled from the moment of conception, and it is from that moment that life begins. So that's what the church is trying to tell us, that a human person is one who is one and at the same time spiritual and corporeal. Can we talk about a human non-person? Is it possible? If it is not possible, then why, we, why are we arguing about who is a human person? When does one begin, uh, become a human person? Who defines them? What traits are we using to define a human person? We can only talk about the physical. If we are looking at the human person on the body. But most times we miss the most important aspect of us, which is the spark of life in us, the spiritual. If we define human beings like a social interaction or even a rational being, then if you have Alzheimer's, you are no longer human, right? We can kill you. If you have a mental problem, like the philosophers would say, if, you are, if man is a rational being and you have a mental problem, then you are no longer human and we can kill you. So those definitions are lacking. The church continues to emphasize that life begins from the moment of conception. Because from that moment of conception, God creates the human soul. What respect do we have for the human embryo, taking into consideration their nature and their identity, the human embryo? The same kind of respect that you and I have as a human being, because that embryo is a human being also. The, the, the respect we have for each one of us as a human being is what we accord them to. <coughs> what about diagnosis? Diagnosing, you know, uh, uh, it's becoming very popular, maybe commonplace, to try to see if my baby is a boy a baby boy or a baby girl. You know, that kind of curiosity. Let me see what I have inside there, right? Uh -huh. And it's okay. If, it is, if diagnosis is meant for medical reasons and maybe to check out if the child is okay and if there is anything that can begin to be treated from the womb, that kind of diagnosis is okay. But if it is just for the human, for the experimentation, of the human person, then such a diagnosis would not be permissible. Many countries have, uh, you know, legislated for abortion, and they, when they do that, they are looking at some individuals in the society as not being equal to the law with the other individuals, not being protected equally by law as the other individuals. So when we say that we can kill from the moment of conception to birth, then we are saying that these ones are not protected by our law. We don't recognize them. The law does not cover them. And assuming that every person who gets pregnant decides to kill, maybe at the, at the end of a decade or two decades, what happens? Complete extermination. Unless now that we are beginning to hear that some people, well, you know, Matthew was, Father Matthew was telling me a while ago at table about, I don't know how many people that had the news this morning about the 
in vitro fertilization and the man that <laughs> invented it and how he has been acclaimed and given award and all that and all that. Is it in vitro? Matthew, Father Matthew. Uh huh. Right. Three million children have been born through the in vitro fertilization. Wow. Anyway, so if the government continues to legislate for abortion and allowing people to abort, then they are saying that our law does not protect certain individual members of our society. That's what it means. And we are talking about the, 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 the unborn children in the womb. Normally, you know, how political issues go, and some of these things, even though you look at them either scientifically or academically, but most of the things that we see happen in the society have political undertones. And sometimes, some of them, people raise issues of moral implications. And then, because we try to shout and uh, try to you know, kick against it, they seem to quarantine it for a while. They submerge it for a while. But you know, after some time, if you are not paying attention enough through the back door, that thing that you think that you have killed comes back. So if we continue to kill the innocents in the womb, who knows? Maybe in the next century, in the next generation, who will be the next target? Because if we think that, if, we, if they think that abortion is an, a concluded issue, then nobody will talk about it again, and it will just go, continue to, you know, happen like it is a normal process of life. And I tell you, the devil does not sleep. One way or another, some other thing that will be brought in just to continue to kill. And who knows, maybe the, the priest like me will be the next target. If you are a priest, you are not covered by law. So that's why it is not, it's dangerous to begin to allow, give allowances for some of these laws. The biblical basis for abortion, God's law says, thou shalt not kill. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Any person that is created in the image and likeness of God, thou shalt not kill. About the human person, David Jeremiah, Job, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, Isaiah, and Paul. All of them we are called from their mother's wombs for the ministry. All of them from their mother's wombs. All of them began to be human persons from their mother's wombs. The, the Greek word, brephos, for infant, this Greek word was used by the mother of John the Baptist. When Mary visited John the Baptist, uh, visited Elizabeth, Elizabeth proclaimed that the child, the infant in her womb, leaped for joy, right? In the womb, he leaped for joy. The same word, brephos, in Greek, meaning infant, in the mother's womb, was also used in the case of Jesus Christ. When the three magi who went to honor Jesus Christ after he was born, the Bible says that they saw the infant Jesus already born. Okay? So, we recognize that the, the one in the womb is as much human being as the one outside the womb. No distinction. That's the Bible.
conclu conclusion that we are making is this. Abortion may be legal by man's law, but it's a cold-blooded murder according to God's law. God does not want us to shed innocent blood, and the hand that sheds innocent blood shall die according to the scripture. So if God does not want innocent blood to be shed, we too must not allow innocent blood to be shared. Thank you and God bless you.